Uh, this session is called Thinking About the Unthinkable. My name is Ken Virosub. I'm at the Geology Department at University of California, Davis in the United States. Uh, and uh, there are three of us who will speak, and then we hope to have time at the end for, we're planning to have time at the end for a discussion. So our first speaker is Carl Taylor, who is he Executive Director of the Fraser Institute for Health Research at Princeton, New Jersey, and he's going to be talking about problems in thinking about the unthinkable. Carl. So why is it we have a difficult time in thinking about the unthinkable? Why are we always surprised by events when they occur. What are the barriers and what are the challenges? It's really what I'm going to try and do in my 20 minutes or so this morning before we get into the discussion. Perhaps one of the barriers and one of the challenges is, well, we're worried about what people might think about us. This is a quote from uh, Lord Levine, who is the chair of Lloyd's of London, that says in 2008, if I had said last year that we were going to be engaged in a worldwide financial meltdown, and in fact it was going to be the emerging countries' economies bailing out the developed nations, people would have wondered what I was smoking. So perhaps that question is what keeps us from thinking about the unthinkable because we don't want personal questions about our life. Also, I would suggest that maybe it's also the fact that the last time we thought about something big and something bold and something unthinkable, H5N1, H1N1, well, it didn't quite work out that way. And so there was a lot of criticism as we go through all of this planning and all this exercise. I spent my prior 12 years in academic medicine, 10 of those, as the director of something called the National Center for Disaster Medical Response. And so we lived the design, the development, the teaching, the training, and the preparation for a global pandemic influenza, running models for a number of life insurance companies on what their expected loss was going to be when, with all due respect, privately as we held retreats, I said this isn't the one to worry about. But in fact, because we, we spent all of that effort, now perhaps there is a reluctance to stand up and talk about multi-drug resistant TB or actually the new New Delhi NDH, uh, NDM1, which is a new bacteria that seems to be able to create its own defenses on the fly against all of the antibiotics that we currently have available to us. And it's already now gotten out of India, moved to Brazil, moved to Russia and other countries. But we're not talking about that. We're not engaged in that. And perhaps we're not engaged in that because do you really want to talk about another global pandemic that may not happen? Maybe we just haven't really thought about the right acronyms yet. You know, think back now to Johnny Chen, the first super spreader of SARS. Well, at the time he was that first super spreader navigating between Hong Kong and Vietnam, it was actually severe acute pulmonary syndrome. And when Americans started to look at that, they thought, you know, SAP is actually sort of not a good phrase in, in American English. And so they changed it to severe acute respiratory syndrome. And all of a sudden, the acronym worked just in time for us to be able to watch our Canadian brothers and sisters fight in a terrible, difficult battle up in Toronto. And I encourage you to read some of the nurses' testimony of what they went through with it. But maybe it's just simply that, well, we've lost some of our capability to talk about challenges. And because we've lost that capability, well, then we're surprised. On the left-hand side, you'll see a representative of a tornado. Last year, about this time, I was actually engaged in a series of after-action reports and hot washes for the 55 tornadoes that were at the front line of the Alabama tornado outbreak, historic in the number of tornadoes, historic in the severity of tornadoes, historic in the loss of life of the tornadoes. So in our very first meeting of our very first after action of our very first hot wash at DCH Hospital in Tuscaloosa, which if you were sitting in this room pretending this is DCH Hospital and you were looking across the courtyard, the Weston Hotel would not be there. That's how close DCH was to the complete devastation and destruction in Tuscaloosa that eliminated 400 businesses. And we stood up and said, we're here to have a discussion. And the incident commander stood up and said, well, let me just tell you the biggest problem we had. We never imagined big enough. 
not in all of our planning, not in all of our preparation, not in all of our hot washes, not in all of our tabletops, did we ever imagine that the very first tornado that came through that day would take out our emergency operations center and our 911 system and our communications? The very first. Why didn't we imagine that? We could have imagined that. Think back only a couple of years earlier to Hurricane Katrina. And Hurricane Katrina, some of you may have seen the videotape. The 35-foot wall of water that hit Hancock County, down by Waveland and Diamond Head and uh, Hancock County. 35-foot wall of water that crashed into the emergency operations center. And the video that you see of coming out of that operations center were of the men and women that were working there taking magic markers and writing their social security numbers on their arms so that when they were found, someone could match up the bodies with who they were, writing notes to their loved ones and putting them up in the rafters above the ceiling because they hoped that that would survive the floods, and then shooting a videotape saying goodbye to their loved ones in which the final line on the videotape was, we who are the rescuers now need rescuing. Why don't we imagine that? Why don't we in our planning imagine that kind of worst case scenario when in our, what Ken said in the introduction of the Ignite session, we really don't have black swans anymore. We can reverse engineer. We understand these problems are out there, but we don't think about them in our planning. Or even worse, the example on the right-hand side, that's the uh, Red River flooding in North Dakota. I'm going to say this two or three more times in my presentation. The flooding that occurred in the Red River is because they developed a plan based on a 54-foot average flood. Problem is Mother Nature doesn't respond to averages. I'm going to come back to that in a bit, but I can tell you that if your disaster plans and response are based on the average event, you will be wrong on average. And we'll come back and talk about that before I get done. The other challenge we have is with cascading events. Events that drive events. Yes, the most recent example, and certainly one to use as you go back home and talk about your disaster planning, obviously is Japan, where the earthquake drives a tsunami, the tsunami drives a nuclear meltdown in Japan now for the first time in 60 years is without nuclear power. But you know, almost every event that I've worked in my career has had some other event behind it. I got a call just after the tornadoes. Last year in Alabama, I got a call from a hospital and said, would you please tell me where all these patients are coming from? And in fact, we started to look at the medical records and the clinical records available to us. And what we realized was that one of the things that tornadoes do is it puts a lot of stuff up in the air. And in fact, because the tornadoes went through a very rural farming area, what it put up in the air were a lot of pesticides and to be quite candid, a lot of chicken excrement. And as it went through, we suddenly had this huge spike, this cascade of respiratory ailments of people now flooding back into the hospitals 15 days after the tornadoes because we now had a cascade of a public health emergency built on a natural disaster of those tornadoes that went through Alabama. And we have a difficult time with that. We have a difficult time connecting dots. We have a difficult time understanding how our actions how our actions create risk. And I've been so grateful both two years ago at this conference and this year, where people are understanding, certainly with this group, that there is a direct consequence to allowing, for example, overbuilding on barrier islands and then wondering why all the property was destroyed when a hurricane comes through. As I've told a friend of mine who was one of our trainers in our disaster center who lost his house with Hurricane Ivan and then Hurricane Katrina, I looked at him and said, David, there's a reason it's called a barrier island. You know, what part of you're in harm's way do you not understand? And yet the community, in order to generate economics, continues to allow people to develop and build. And the insurers, much to my amazement, continue to insure the properties that are built there simply to watch them get knocked down again. What part of connecting our actions to thinking about risk do we still need to educate? the private sector and the political sector so that we can jointly make better decisions together. This is an incredibly busy slide and I could actually spend the rest of the morning on it and not even begin to get done, but here's the point of the slide. It comes from Peter Scott Morgan's book called The Reality of Global Crises. And it's a really good book. I recommend you reading it. 
a quick caveat, you will be depressed when you get through. So make sure there's a good bottle of South African wine nearby. Although when you finish, it'll be all right. But here's what he says. The fundamental piece is, and I listened to some presentations yesterday, and this isn't a criticism, but, but it's just an observation. Droughts do not occur in a vacuum. A drop in food production does not occur in a vacuum. What we need to understand is what are the political capabilities to respond and mitigate? What are the financial capabilities? What are the private sector capabilities? What part is industrialization playing on this? Yes, it may be a natural phenomenon, but we need to know more than just what nature's doing. We need to understand the surrounding infrastructure and ability if we're actually going to adequately respond. We need to understand the religious, the cultural, and the ethnic differences. When we had the BP oil spill in the Gulf, which I worked extensively, one of the things, for example, that we found was that most of the fishermen along the Gulf in Alabama were, uh, were from Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And what we realized was that their entire industry had been devastated because they could no longer fish because the fishing grounds were closed. And yet we had a hard time coming to them and saying, you know, we have services to help you because they didn't want the services. We saw this huge spike in alcoholism. We saw this huge spike in the need for mental health services, and yet we were unable to engage in that dialogue with them because they didn't want to talk with us about the challenges. They didn't want to talk about the rise in spousal abuse. They didn't want to talk about the rise in depression because in their culture, that's not something that they would want to communicate with an outsider like us, even though we were there to say, we have help and we have assistance. One of the things I do in my day job now, we have a call center that speaks 17 languages trying to help mostly homeless people and underserved people find health information and find places to deliver care. And yet there's a whole subset of population that simply they do not want to discuss their health issues with who they perceive as simply strangers. We need to understand as we're thinking greater, what are those ethnic cultural sensitivities that we can engage in a dialogue meaningfully so that we can in fact imagine greater and prepare better. Because we don't deal often with complexities, now that's not a generalization for this room. Obviously you deal in complexities and you're leaders because you're here. But for all those other folks that aren't here, that aren't understanding risk, what happens is when we don't deal with complexities and we don't think big enough, we violate the sort of 4M rule. The very first thing that we do is we have to look at a motive of why we're not thinking bigger. Take a look at BP, for example, when they're filing their application with mining and minerals to be able to drill the deep water horizon, their motive was what? Anybody want to guess? Starts with another M, money, right? My motive is I want to drill that well because it's got oil in it and it's going to be a producer. So, so the motive is money, which means they create a myth. If they had gone to mining and minerals and said, you know, this is really going to be a mess. We're going to drill for a while and then we're going to pollute most of the Gulf of Mexico. Would they have been likely to have actually gotten that permit to drill? No, I don't think so either. So what happens is because the motive is money, then they create a myth. And the myth is nothing bad can ever happen. You ever heard that before? Right? I, you know, we go this every time we go out, particularly to small towns, and you'd sit down with a hospital and say, can we talk about preparedness? And the answer is, you know, nothing bad ever happens in Opelika. You know? So the myth becomes nothing bad ever happens. What's very interesting about that is that BP actually believed their own myth because at the time of the Deepwater Horizon event, BP had waived their reinsurance and had become self-insured for all events occurring out of that well. So they believed their own myth. And the myth actually was built on two other M's. One is magnitude. Nothing bad could ever happen, but if it does, it's going to just be a small event which then leads to the fourth M, which is management. Don't worry, we've got this covered. And that's where overconfidence will get you in trouble. Perhaps one of the biggest sins in our industry is to actually believe that you've got it all covered, that you know everything, that you can respond, and it'll all be okay. That's what will tend to get you in trouble. And then there's the group that says, well, I don't want to think about that because that's out of my control. It happens a lot in communities. You know, well, that climate, climate change, that's 
something for the big government to take care of. That's somebody else's problem. There's, there's really nothing that we can do, and yet if I have enough time when you get to my last slide, at the end of the day, we've got to build grassroots response. This is really about empowering communities to understand that they're the ones that are going to be most impacted by the events that are occurring. I heard this a couple of days ago and I thought, oh, what a wonderful point. And the other part is that sometimes what happens in the US, I know not where you are, but in the US, the people who are vested with the disaster planning, disaster management, in fact, are so far down the organization that it's very hard for them to actually gain visibility at the sea level, the C chief executives, chief operating officers. And so they're doing plans because their insurance companies require them, or they're doing plans because it's checkbox fulfillment, but they don't have enough of a voice to really be able to be heard. And so as a result, the purpose of what they're doing, instead of truly assessing and understanding risk, is I'm doing this because it's another survey my insurance company told us to do. The purpose is flawed. On top of that, we layer on top the wrong tools. This is called a hazard vulnerability assessment. It is, at least by my opinion, actually worse than useless because what it does is it allows you to choose, I have a hurricane risk, do I think it will be a big, medium, or low risk? Here's an issue, I want the box that says all the above. The problem that we've got, and I want to come back to this, is that you've got to plan literally for any eventuality. Mother Nature gets a vote in how she is going to visit your communities. And it's very difficult in terms of trying to bucket these things simply in small buckets of risk. This is actually a different approach. This is Carl's approach. I'm working with two young Kenyan developers. And our goal really started fairly simply, and it was, can we begin to build, and I thought Ken did such a good job at the Ignite session, can we begin to build more visualization? The prior panel talked about how satellite imagery creates visualization, and if you can visualize risk, you can get into a dialogue about risk, and visualization leads to understanding. So what we started to do is just go back through historical data as a place to start, to say, can we grab data now? for African countries and can we begin to populate this sort of longitudinal historic data and begin to point out where we think that there are flaws and that the website's up and we're going to continue building on it because my kids are just spectacular and they have a real heart for disaster response. And so what we're trying to do is once we get the historical data built is then allow people to comment on, well, what is the government? What are the cultural impacts? What are the challenges that we've got from a healthcare and delivery side? What is it that either makes us more likely to be resilient in the face of disaster or prospectively more fragile, as we saw in New Orleans with Katrina? New Orleans was a classic example of a city that had significant social economic problems. So they had poor capabilities at the city level, poor capabilities at the state level, an uneven response at the federal level, but in fact, New Orleans' biggest problem was simply that the Ninth Ward was not before Katrina and is not now, resilient enough to be able to at least participate in their own management of risks. And that's one of the challenges that we've got to try and overcome. And then we've got the math. This is one of my favorite slides. I don't know if you can see the middle of it. It says, I think there's a problem with step two, which says, and then a miracle occurs. Let me get back to this. There is no regression to the mean in disaster planning. And here's, again, what I mean. You may buy insurance policies based on 10-year averages of events. But for those of you in this room who have responsibility for managing disasters, you're going to have to manage the outer bands and outer edges of those events when they visit your locale. You have got to plan for the worst at the edge of this. And I would suggest that one of the things you begin to do is really start with recalculating the risk that we have at hand. I call it the economic value of actionable information. And what I mean by that is, give me information that I can really truly understand what's at risk. It's not my insured value, but it's human life plus property life plus my community in New Orleans, one third of all their citizens still have not moved back into New Orleans. And for that third that have not moved back, many of them were the economic contributors to that city. We've got to be able to understand what the, the unfortunate inability of mitigation will do to the loss of our community. 
not the insured value, but the loss of our entire community. Tuscaloosa tornadoes, less than half of the businesses have been rebuilt because of the difficult economic times. That tornado took more out. There were literally entire towns in Alabama that were, that were wiped out. I'm gonna zip through in the interest of time, but when we get this right, we're going to get to a new model of thinking in which there's a high visualization in which each of us in this room are at the table contributing what we know best how to contribute to how we see the risk that is fully developed. Let me just build this out quickly and then I'm gonna close with these slides. The very first thing that we've got to do when we leave this room is we've got to find a way to begin to build trust across borders. And when I talk about borders, I'm not talking about geographic borders. I'm talking about those borders that exist between city, provincial, and federal government. I'm talking about those borders that exist between science and industry. I'm talking about those borders that exist between healthcare and insurers. It really is all the borders. I, it's interesting, I, I have a story came from Nelson Mandela's first minister of public health and I had dinner with him several months ago and I said, would you tell me how Nelson Mandela did it? Tell me how N Nelson Mandela did it. And he said, I'll tell you the secret. He said, when Nelson Mandela would walk into a white South African in 1991, after being in jail off and on for 27 years, 18 of those I think at Robben Island, he'd walk in and he'd say, you know, to the white South African, you and I are just alike. Just alike. We want a country that's prosperous and safe and has a future for your children and your grandchildren, for my children and my grandchildren. You know we're just alike. We need to build those same bridges of trust across all the disciplines for whom we serve. From that then, what we need to do is drive behavioral change. Can we think, and this conference is a leader at this, in driving the change from simply response, it is going to happen to a change to mitigation. Can we actually do things proactively to either prevent or reduce disaster. Sergio Mora, who I know I, is a, works a lot with the World Bank, has a wonderful line. He says, there are no natural disasters. There are only natural hazards that meet poor planning. And the way that we can do that is create the economic value of actionable information, the reason why you want me to be compelled to do something different than that which I'm currently doing. Climate change could certainly benefit from that among some other things. And then truly what we can do is use these forums and use these new tools, the things that Gavin's gonna talk about and Ken's gonna talk about to really truly build both local and global change in which we're both participating together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Our, our next speaker is Gavin McGregor Skinner, who is let me get that up there, who is uh, on, on the faculty of the Department of Public Health Services of the College of Medicine at Penn State. And his topic is resilience and the unthinkable. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gavin McGregor Skinner. Uh, this morning we're going to focus on resilience, which means putting a greater emphasis on what communities can do for themselves and how to strengthen their capacities rather than concentrating on their vulnerability to disaster or environmental shocks or stresses in the needs of emergencies. So by definition, the type and severity of losses associated with unthinkable events are difficult to anticipate. Yet very often, External assistance takes time to arrive, and the community is left to itself. So today, I'll present an examples of historical emergencies and provide snapshots through a health lens of how communities have shown resilience. Helping themselves, the people's initial response. In a cyclone-prone country like Madagascar, 60% of the storms that form over the Indian Ocean are felt in Madagascar. The Malagasy National Disaster Office organises annual simulation exercises in vulnerable areas to test the preparedness of local authorities and communities. UNICEF provides and supports a program in schools with school teachers that deliver very simple but important messages. For example, weigh down the roofs with sandbags, reinforce the walls of your houses, put important belongings in plastic bags and store water. And so that 
In February of 2012, this year, when Cyclone Giovanna hit Madagas Madagascar, traveling through Madagascar, you, it was visual to anyone who would be able to see that the villages that had heard these messages, and you could see the sandbags on the roofs, compared to the, the villages that hadn't received these messages. In Thailand, the Village Health Volunteer Scheme has been in place for over 30 years. It serves as the backbone of the community-based public health in the country. They were established as the primary health care system. Today, in every village in Thailand, there is at least one village health volunteer. So countrywide, there's over 750,000 of these volunteers. And they're responsible for small groups of 5 to 15 households. What did we see? after the 2004 tsunami, in those critical hours where people in the communities were left to themselves. The village health volunteers provided medical and also psychosocial support and health services to those affected communities immediately and straight away. And those stories were told to us as we arrived in Thailand to provide needed donor and international support. So the value of traditional wisdom and modern awareness. Many of us have heard the stories that were told after the tsunami on the that it hit Southeast Asia and especially Indonesia on the 26th of December. The first telltale signs of the tsunami coming was that the, the receding seawaters. And we've seen the videos, if you've not watched them on YouTube, of the people with their curiosity running down to the, to, 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 the, to the beach to have a look at the exposed seabed. Many of them ran down to, those, down to the beach that day unbeknown, unknowing, unknowingly what was going to happen next. But there are certain communities that we heard stories that reacted differently. And why? For example, down here in the bottom right-hand corner is the island of Similu. If I was reading about this story today, I would still be a sceptical. But when I arrived there 10 days after the tsunami, in a population of 83,000, where only seven people died after the enormous catastrophe that had occurred in Banda Aceh, people were telling us that their grandparents and their parents sat around at night telling us stories about the Great Wave. Hadn't seen the Great Wave, but they'd heard about it. So that when the water went out on Simulu Island, the people ran for the hills. How in today do we capture these, this story, these local knowledges with all the technology we have to ensure that these stories are still passed to people within the community? So the importance of local capacity in responding to an emergency. First, in October 2005, it was the Kashmir earthquake that mauled large parts of northern Pakistan, including the district of Shangla and the town of Karora. Overall, in Pakistan, 80,000 80, people died. 3.5 million people were homeless. Then, in the summer of 2010, came the floods, washing away whatever recovery they had made in the past five years. And I think the BBC News captured it in this quote from an official from the Karora Hospital. They had designed the structure to resist, to resist earthquakes, but God sent the floods. So after the earthquakes of 2005, the Earthquake Reconstruction and Rehabilitation Authority was formed. Pakistan received 5.4 billion US dollars arrived in aid. In the town of Karora, where the earthquake had completely destroyed the hospital, the hospital was rebuilt at a cost of $590,000. And it was located in this great central spot that everyone said this would be a great location for a hospital, Everyone would go there. But we didn't expect the floods of 2010. And what happened to the hospital? It was washed away. What was interesting, though, in the post-earthquake, both the assistance, the rehabilitation, the train that was conducted in Karora, when we went to Karora, even though the doctors and the nurses were saying, it may not look like a hospital, but where we are now, this is the hospital. So through the training that they had received, through the logistic supply chains that had been set up, through the transportation systems that had been set up, the hospital continued to save lives even after the flood. 
We saw something similar at the Badang, the Badang earthquake uh, of 2009. More than 100,000 buildings and structures suffered severe damage. Among the many health facilities, 10 major hospitals, over 200 community health centres, two very important pharmaceutical warehouses were destroyed. So in such a disaster as the Padang earthquake, it's not always possible to avoid the structural damage, but what we saw from this particular hospital, they had, they had preparedness plans and response plans, and the staff had received training both in their personal safety, but also had conducted drills. And we saw that from this hospital, in a very short period of time, an ICU, obstetric, paediatric wards, admission, and emergency room services had been set up, set up in tents beside the damaged hospital. So again, the hospital and the staff were prepared to serve the community post-disaster. Grassroot preparedness makes the difference. In Indonesia, avian influenza, H5N1. What was the very early warning system that occurred in Indonesia? Sick people, dying people. Those that died, they were the early warning system. But that's not how the disease works. It affects chickens. And the chickens should be the first to die, and that's what we should be responding to. But we weren't. We were responding to reports of people being, getting sick and dying. So it was decided in 2008, let's intensify the surveillance system. 5,000 government workers were mobilised to cover the whole country with rapid diagnostic kits and take samples to send to laboratories. In a very short period of time, we discovered an unthinkable event. H5N1 had been laboratory confirmed in 30 of 33 provinces, 216 of 440 districts. But we had no response plan. What do we do next? Again, not having this in place, we sat down at the table with the Indonesian government and said, what existing networks do you have? What existing collaborations do you have? So for example, in Western Java, there was an ex a close collaboration between two local partners the Indonesian Red, Cross, Red Crescent Society and Muhammadiyah, who had responded collaboratively to many disasters previously. And it was on that community-based network that by the end of 2009, they had reached 27,000 villages. How did they do that? They started off by training and certifying 80 master trainers, who in turn trained 2,000 volunteer sub-district coordinators, who in turn then trained 25,000 coordinators at the village level. This mobilisation over a very short period of time of massive human resources through training. And what did they ask in return? New t-shirts. That's all we needed. We had the earthquake one, we had the tsunami one, can you pay for us to have the avian influenza one? How did they communicate? Through SMS text messages. What did they do? They created a large uh, um, actions of participatory community-based trainers that facilitated participatory risk mapping. And here you can see a husband and wife that is part of a community effort putting in what they know about happened in their community when H5N1 came and killed their chickens. And what was the product? Well, they developed maps that showed both spatial and temporal information the community identified their own risk factors, and then community-based in interventions were developed and implemented. And this works very well at the rural village level. But what we also found, it was successful at both an urban and a city environment. And here, in a suburb of Jakarta, that had an outbreak of H5N1, again, a person was a sentinel that died at the hospital, shown on the map, and the government came in and closed all of the markets. Not just the animal markets, but every market was closed. That leads to a lot of social problems. People don't have a place to, to congregate and discuss. Through participatory mapping of this neighbourhood, what was found, and after also the government conducted intensive environmental sampling of the markets, especially the bird markets, and found no evidence of H5N1 virus, but through participatory mapping, the community identified, well, hang on, people from other communities owed us money. So instead of paying us money, they were giving us chickens, and they were giving us sick chickens, and they were giving us dead chickens, and they were telling us those chickens were just asleep, and people were so desperate to get money to make, to make a livelihood that they were accepting them. And again, again mobilisation of the community, 
new messages had to go out. With 25,000 local village coordinators that were all communicating on a network through SMS text message, both sending information up the chain and allowing the government to blast information back to them, led to the community developing using their own resources, pooling their own money to buy backpack sprayers, disinfectants, and then, and then coming up with gatekeepers that protected movement in and out of their, their communities or their villages. And what surprised me about this is we are in a very remote area of Western Java. And why is this guy so happy? Because he's just stopped a United Nations vehicle convoy from going through his community. And he's pulled, all he's done, he's done it with a backpack sprayer. And he was in such a prestigious position that anything that came up this dirt road was stopped and he used his sprayer to ensure that there was no contamination, faeces on those vehicles. But that led us to another problem. We were tracking the amount of disinfectant that was being used through Indonesia. Huge amounts. And there was concern that some areas were becoming free of the disease and other areas were not, but they were using disinfectant. The government went out and tested those areas and found they were using the disinfectant the wrong concentration. So again, using the same simple mobile phones that we were using to keep this network working together, working with local resources and also international corporate companies, a simple calculator was developed that could be then loaded onto these phones to help as a guideline of how to make up the right concentration of disinfectant. So what about if we look at natural disasters that have not only caused less damage, less loss of life, and found out what was the difference? Well, in 2007, in Bangladesh, a Category 4 cyclone hit, the co hit Bangladesh with a loss of 3,000 lives. Let's compare that to an event that occurred in 2008 that went through the Irrawaddy Delta of Myanmar and killed 138,000. And remember that it not only killed 138,000, but the government stopped counting when they reached 138,000. And a lot of us believe that the, the death toll at that event was much larger. What happened in Bangladesh the year before? Well, the Bangladesh government had already built cyclone and flood shelters. But there was always this conversation. The people live here in the communities. The cyclone and flood shelters are here. How are we going to get these people into shelters and save lives? And what they did, using f over 40,000 Red Crescent volunteers on bicycles with megaphones, went out to the 15 provinces on a nice sunny day, telling everyone there's a Category 4 cyclone about to hit. And they were so convincing that over 2 million people evacuated and went and entered these shelters, and subsequently only 3,000 people lost their life. Look at this historical... Um, storms in Bangladesh and of the 70s and the 80s and you'll see the much more loss of life when people have stayed in place in high vulnerable risk areas. Cooperation among sectors improves humanitarian response. Again, going back to, to Indonesia, the Jogjakarta earthquake. The initial response by the government was to mobilise 6,000 health workers were dispatched to the disaster zone. They all came on motorbikes, what we saw that the government workers there used storyboards to help the communities understand and mitigate the effects of what had happened in the earthquake. World Health Organization then facilitated that the, the local resources were working well, but the internationals, the donors, the NGOs, the consultants weren't being connected, so they formed the health clusters and many health cluster type um, meetings were held on a regular daily basis that, that facilitated coordination. What was really interesting, I showed you that map of Indonesia and where we found the, the, the great ex geographical expanse of H5N1 virus, high viral load. The governor of Jogjakarta actually won an award during that same time from the president because he'd used his earthquake model and applied it to the H5 avian influenza outbreak, again, using storyboards and mobilising people to outreach to the communities. A, we've seen evidence from, from disasters. What about post-conflict situations? With the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement in December 1995, Annex 7 was really important because it had the agreement on refugees and displaced persons. We arrived, when I arrived there in January 1990, 
uh, 6 to then show the bit my mandate was to show the benefits of peace we all had this great idea that if we rebuild the houses rebuilt the services in the villages the over 1.3 million people that were stuck in these IDP camps would just get up and go back to the villages and over a, a few months intensive effort rebuilt these structures but they didn't leave we went back to the camps and went well who's making the decisions and we found that within the camps over the five years of the conflict the pro these professional social community teams had been formed and they were formed within a framework of decision making within the community and they consisted of doctors nurses veterinarians dentists and school teachers again don't forget the school teachers and they assisted in making and representing and, def and defining the resources and the needs of the communities so much so even though we'd rebuilt the towns and the villages they were they were th this was the barrier so again we started a, a number of health service um, projects we used a lot of maps to show that yes we were being fair and equitable equitable among Serbs Croats and Muslims and over time the professional community wanted to go back and we got a phone call late one night on the, on the IDP camp that I was working on those 30,000 people they're walking down the road and again I, by identifying who the decision makers were within the community allowed us to work effectively and efficiently in bringing back normalcy the Haitian earthquake occurred late Tuesday afternoon January the 12th 2010 by this time and we've heard a lot this week about mission 4636 and the fantastic work they did in Haiti we've also heard that at this time Twitter had already emerged as a place to highlight breaking news galvanize people around the world when the earthquake occurred I was in Washington DC and I sat in an emergency operations room uh, looking at what health needs were required in those really critical hours and days after the earthquake not once during the time I was in the emergency operation of uh, center did I hear about anything mentioned about Twitter in a post after action report this map was presented and we were shown that 2.3 million Twitter messages tweets were sent out from that afternoon of Tuesday January the 12th to Thursday January the 14th there was no linkage there between what was being relayed on Twitter or being or the information being synthesized and related to those who were making decisions in the emergency operations center what we did hear about though while I was sitting there was the work that the American Red Cross was doing through text messaging and raising money and in a four-day period of that first week after the earthquake using their 90999 system which over 190,000 tweets or individual tweets were sent about this donation system where that you would you would send the word Haiti on a text message and ten dollars you didn't need a, a MasterCard you didn't need a credit card ten dollars was added to your phone bill in four days the American Red Cross raised over eight eight million dollars so again we're still sitting here now hearing the great things that social media can do and has done but we're still working out from an incident command system or an emergency operations center how do we feed in who's going to synthesize and summarize 2.3 million messages who's going to provide them at the numerous out updates that we have and the numerous situation reports that we produce each day so again I'm very fortunate I get to work with a lot of passionate people and a lot of creative people but again we still have to work at how we're going to leverage the resources we have how we're going to synthesize the information we have and how we're going to focus on our goal to transform vulnerable or at-risk communities to disaster resilient communities again realizing that in reality no community can be free of risk thank you very much Okay, thank you, Gavin. <clears throat> and I am the last speaker, and there we go. Thank you. Um, and uh, my talk, when I had to give a title, I said, "Can new technology save us from the unthinkable?" Since then, my my uh, thinking has evolved quite a bit, and so I think I would rather call it, "Can new perspectives save us from the unthinkable?" <clears throat> 
And for those of you who either visited the website or who read the notes that were handed out, uh, we did try to have an online discussion about this. And uh, as, as a backdrop for all of it, we used the, uh, the, the British comedy show Monty Python, in which there's a, a fairly well-known uh, little scene in which a British, a young British couple is sitting and, and talking, and then all of a sudden three of the characters from the from this from Monty Python uh, burst in dressed as Spanish car uh, cardinals, uh, and the young man in the in the uh, of, of the couple says, uh, "I wasn't expecting the Spanish Inquisition," and one of Michael Palin says, "No one ever expects the Spanish Inquisition," and we use that as a sort of a starting point to think about begin to think about. Uh, unthinkable things. So I'd been thinking about these unthinkable things for a while. I was trying to pull my ideas together, and I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to take a hot air balloon ride in the Napa Valley of California over the vin vineyards that are out there. And as the balloon was going up, I, I was looking down and saying, boy, you get a completely different view of farming practices, of, of vineyard practices, and how everything is going on. And suddenly it like hit me that that's really what we might want to be thinking about here, and that is having a completely different perspective about how we think about the unthinkable. So um, uh, as a further backdrop and as an example of this, uh, two years ago at the conference in Washington, uh, I ran a session uh, called Black Swans and White Whales. Black Swans was a metaphor for something which Europeans before 1697 did not believe existed because they had never seen black swans in Europe. And then uh, uh, Wilhelm de, de Fleming sailed into, I think it was Brisbane or some harbor in Australia or some bay in Australia, and there were black swans. And so black swans was a metaphor for, some, became a metaphor for something that uh, we did not ever believe existed and then suddenly we found that it was real and white whales was supposed to be a metaphor for things that we knew existed but were very, very rare. But as Carl has pointed out, um, uh, part of the problem is that everybody uses this excuse, we never imagined it could be this bad. So everything is sort of a black swan or a white whale, um, but there are a lot of smart people out there now and people really are beginning to understand these things. Quite recently, uh, Popocatapetl in Mexico started to, to, to smoke a little bit and, and uh, looked like it might uh, begin to erupt, may have even had a small eruption. Uh, at the foot of Popocatapetl is the city of Pueblo, uh, Pueblo uh, Mexico, which is a major city in Mexico, and less than 50 or 60 kilometers away is Mexico City. So an unthinkable event is a major eruption from this volcano, which could, in fact, make Pueblo into another Pompeii and dump a large amount of ash on Mexico City. We can think about these things. We know that these things are out there. And I would almost, as I said in the Ignite session, maybe there really aren't any black swans and maybe all these swans that we're talking about are white. We can, there are always people who think about these things and who have some ideas about them. So one of the things we need to realize is that um, uh, these things are out there and we can, um, some people at least can verbalize them. The other thing that was going on last several weeks was the whole crisis with the euro and I kept thinking about that in terms of unthinkable events and maybe that's an unthinkable event and it was always the domino effect and it dawned on me that that's just such a, a powerful metaphor for what was going on. You didn't need to take a course in economics or have a degree in, in finance planning to understand that if, if Greek banks failed, then the Spanish banks would fail and everything else would go down. So I thought maybe what we need to do is start thinking about a, a bestiary, a vocabulary to describe some of these unthinkable events. They are not all the same. They're different. So here's an attempt. To, to, to talk about some of these, one could have a domino event, which you have a main event that produces a primary impact, but that produces another impact and so forth down the line. And the Pakistan flood, for example, would be uh, a, a possible case of a domino effect. You had a tremendous amount of rain in the northwest 
portion of the country, and that just simply moved down, and each of the successive dominoes came down. Um, I also showed this at the Ignite session. You could have a cascade event. Carl actually referred to it. We have a primary event, and has a main event produces some primary impacts, and then those have secondary impacts, and the totality of those impacts is what becomes the unthinkable event. And my example is the same as Carl's. We did not actually collaborate on all of these things, but they, we, we were all thinking in the same way. The Japanese earthquake and tsunami uh, could easily be viewed as one of these cascade events. There was a whole cascade of things that occurred on land, on Japan, that had nothing to do with the nuclear event, but then the nuclear event was another part of this, and a whole cascade of things happened that ultimately led to the destruction of four of uh, the six nuclear, reactor nuclear reactors that were there. And then there's something that I call a compound event, which is where you have two events, neither of which is really that bad by itself, but they occur, occur simultaneously. And because of that, you produce a main event with a lot of uh, impact. Um, and I think we're actually seeing something close to that going on in Washington, D.C. now. I don't know if any of you are following this, but there was this huge heat wave, temperatures reaching 37 to 41 degrees in the eastern part of the United States, coupled with a massive outbreak of thunderstorms that, also, that knocked out electricity to over 1.5 million people, or 2 million people at one point. And so either of these by themselves, people would be able to handle it because we do have lots of air conditioning, but the storm knocked out the electric power, and then with the heat, we had the makings of this compound event. And finally, uh, just as another example, something that I call a perfect storm event, where again, you start with some kind of a normal event, and a lot of external factors then feed in to make that an unthinkable event. And the best example I can think of at the moment is Eifayat Jochet in, in Iceland uh, a, a, a year ago, uh, two years ago, um, where a relatively small volcanic eruption from a relatively minor volcano in Iceland just happened to have erupted through the right amount of ice to produce enough ash of the right size to be lofted up to the right height where the airplanes were, and then that ash got injected into a very stagnant weather pattern over Europe, and the entire European air system over Europe was brought down by that. And we almost had it again because the Grimsvatten eruption the next year almost created the same initial conditions, but the ash was slightly different, and more importantly, that stagnant weather pattern didn't develop until three days um, after this, the, this eruption went up. So we were saved from something like that. So I think beginning to try and differentiate these into, into separate categories is a useful thing. Um, I'm a geologist, and I am a little bit leery of anybody like myself who tries to categorize things. For many years, people have come up with landslide categorizations, and the only problem with these, these charts of landslide categorizations is that the landslides don't read the charts. So um, the same is probably true with unthinkable events. They overlap. And, but it's, I think, a useful exercise to begin talking about these in some kind of a differentiated way so that we can look at classes of responses to different kinds of, 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 of events. And I also think that, uh, that what George San Santayana said, uh, what, 70 years ago or more, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Um, when I came to California to teach at University of California Davis 37 years ago, one of the things I heard about early on was that there had been this huge flood in Sacramento in 1862, and I picked up bits and pieces about it, but just a week ago I went to an all-day conference on this flood because it was the 150th anniversary year of that flood. Um, and the one thing that was the, the, the real interesting take-home message for me about that flood was in 1862, in the winter of 1862, when Sacramento flooded, the entire Wilmette Valley in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, was flooded, and Los Angeles was also flooded. 
And the analysis of that now seems to indicate that the weather system actually flipped into a different state, a, a, a state of being, rather, um, that, that dropped an enormous amount of rain all the way up and down the west coast. So we saw a much larger, it, it turns out this is a much larger event than, than anybody had ever really talked about. Um, there are some other things in the historical record that are interesting. The year before Europeans got to California was the last year of a 70-year drought in California that we now learn from the tree ring records. Okay, and during the entire 70 years, 7-0, seven rainfall in, in California was less than it was during any of the things that we now call drought years in the 20th century. That's really scary, okay? But that's out there. There are other things that are out there. We need to learn from the historical record. 1966, there was flooding in Florence. Very significant flooding. Water was coming over the, the roadway of, the, of the, the, um, um, the bridge across the Arno. Uh, and um, if you walk through Florence, there are places where you will see plaques on the wall, and there's often two sets of plaques. The one on the top was the 1967, 66 flood. The one below it was the height of the water in 1557. So this is an example of basically a 500 year flood. And there's, you know, we could go back and look at what happened then. There are other places where these things have occurred and we need to come up with a better understanding of this. And I think uh, Gavin is absolutely right that it's not only, uh, my, it's not only the, the written historical record that's important, but it's also sort of the cultural record that's important. Uh, Gavin gave the example of, of uh, uh, the cultures that were aware of, of tsunamis. My favorite story is about growing potatoes in the Andes. The indigenous groups in the Andes before the Spanish arrived dealt with natural climate variability by, by growing or by using a variety of potatoes as a staple crop and, and they used different, they used potatoes that grew better at different altitudes. But because one farmer couldn't grow, couldn't tend crops at all the different altitudes, there was a system in place where 10% of the crop that I was growing at a low altitude actually belonged to my brother-in-law who was growing at a higher altitude and 10% of his high altitude crop belonged to me. It was essentially an insurance system based on potatoes. I think there were a lot of adaptive mechanisms that have been completely lost that we need to go back and look at and learn from. So I think learning from history is not bad, a bad idea. And then there is uh, lots of new technology that's available. 50%, the cell phone, mobile phone penetration in Africa is something like 50%. Not entirely sure what that means. Does that mean half the people have access to phones? Or is that just the number of phones divided by the number of people? But in any event, it's a large proportion, and it's true in other places. And there have been various other, there have been a number of cases where phones have been used to, to provide information that would be useful. Uh, for example, in Italy, uh, there is now regularly flooding of the, of, of, of the center of Venice uh, due to a whole range of things that I will not talk about. But if you are an owner of a restaurant in, in, in the Piazza San Marco, you need to know at 5 o'clock in the morning whether or not you should go shopping at the market or go down and sandbag your restaurant doors. And so, uh, because there's an, an aqua alta coming in. And there is now a system you can log on, you can sign up to get an SMS text message at 5 o'clock in the morning that will tell you how high the water will be. There's a, there's a uh, city in, in Vermont, uh, Montpelier, Vermont, uh, which has had flooding problems, and they also have this alert system that they use through a Google group that provides uh, information about uh, impending floods. Uh, it also, if there is a flood situation going on, they will provide information about whether you need to boil your water and, and other issues. So these things are possible. Uh, Gavin mentioned the, the, the flooding in Bangladesh. I have not followed up on this, but this was certainly an attempt 
to see whether cell phones or mobile phones could be used to warn people in addition to the megaphone approach. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was in Nepal. Uh, we were there, uh, actually, it was on July 4th, just the state the, uh, two years ago. Um, and the people were waiting for the monsoon. The summer monsoon had not started. And these women were out planting rice, but they did not know whether the rains would come soon enough for their rice to flourish or for their rice to die. Uh, and so it dawned on me that why, with the kind of cell phone pre penetration that we have, the kinds of information system, why they couldn't be told, we are expecting the monsoon on a particular day and plan your planting accordingly. So that's another example of how things could be used. I was in Buenos Aires once and they were, they were dealing with flooding, they were dealing with levees, and, they, and I was told by the, one of the managers for, that, for the flooding that the problem is we have too many levees. We can't monitor, or we don't have enough people to monitor the levees. Well, why can't people go out and monitor, provide information and monitoring of levees? Same thing in the Mississippi River. Again, there were hundreds of miles of levees that needed to be monitored. There were only a certain number of people who could be used to monitor it and why we could not be organized in advance to have people go out and provide that information. And it's not only people who can provide information. Cars can provide information. It turns out that Hondas in Japan are equipped with a GPS system that communicates back with, with the, the Honda mothership, wherever that is in Japan. And after the Japanese earthquake, they were able to flip this whole system on, and they were essentially able to monitor every single Honda that was moving in the area that was affected by, by the tsunami. Well, if you take all of those little signals and put them together, you wind up with a map of the open roads in that area. You immediately know which roads are accessible and which ones are not. And so this is a way of using that kind of information. Um, and then there are social media. Uh, we Twitter, Facebook, uh, Mixit with, that we heard about at the Ignite session. Uh, and again, people are beginning to examine and explore some of this. The United States Geological Survey has a Twitter earthquake project. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, Twitter harvests every one of your messages. Okay, they don't read them all, but they at least harvest them, and they can, can, they can track every single word that you use, and what they, what they can do is they can look at the number of messages that use the word earthquake in the United States. And um, there's a certain noise level that goes on all the time, but as soon as the number of messages of, in a particular area exceeds that threshold, the survey now somebody in the survey gets an alarm, gets a reading, that there's a lot of Twitter messages coming up. And sure, they also know from seismology that there's been an earthquake. But what's interesting is that you can then plot the number of tweets that use the word earthquake as a function of time. Um, and you can do two things with this. First of all, you can see how many. And eventually, we'll get to enough knowledge that the number of tweets will give us a sense of how devastating, of how strong that earthquake is. And the other thing is that the regional distribution of those gives you some idea of what the damage region in is. And this is information that is essentially instantaneous and is much, much more effective to planners or responders than what you get after an hour or so, which is the normal lead time for these sorts of things. Um, and then br briefly, there's Crisis Camp ha Haiti. I got in, dragged into, the, or not dragged, but I got involved in that after the Haiti earthquake. And uh, uh, they were doing, there was, there was a GOI image of Port-au-Prince, which was made available uh, by the United States government almost instantaneously. Um, this was like one and, one and a half days after the earthquake. But this image was not very useful, even though it had one meter resolution, it was not very useful because the available map for Port-au-Prince Haiti on the web was this one. So you could see a road was open, but you had no idea what road it was. So they, they, at, at the uh, crisis camp, they then produced a map of Haiti that could be overlain 
uh, on which you could overlay that GOI image. This has now developed into, into the uh, open, whatever it is, the, the workshop that we're going to have on open mapping. Um, they also developed at, on the fly something called Tweak the Tweet so that people could then have a standard format of messaging by putting in these hashtags, then these ha this, this tweet could be read, processed, and used to provide information. Otherwise, figuring out where the, where the important points were in the one above was not there. Um, and they also developed some people finders, which were then available online and ready to go when the Japanese earthquake occurred. So uh, all of those are, are, are examples of technology. I don't think we have any idea yet what the limits of this technology are, um, but I think we really need to move ahead and, and find that. And one final thought that I want to want to make, uh, maybe what we should have said at the beginning is nobody ever wants to think about the, the Spanish Inquisition. On the other hand, people would be very happy to think about other Spanish things like sangria and tapas and paella and flamenco and Velazquez and Cervantes and most other parts of Spanish culture. And so maybe people will only begin to think about the unthinkable if they see benefits, other benefits in doing so. And so the wrong way to begin the conversation with decision makers is you need to think about this problem because we're all going to die. Okay? And a better way, and I've heard this in different forms at some of these other sessions, was we need to think about this problem because addressing it will have the following additional benefits. And that's how we have to embed all of this. So uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. And I hope I've got all of these correct. And I apologize if I don't. So thank you. Okay. Um, and now for something completely different for those of you who are Monty Python fans. Uh, I'm not going to ask for questions. What we're going to do is we're going to have the two panelists come up and sit over here. And what we would really like to do is have a discussion with those of you in the audience. We've thrown out some ideas about how we can move forward in terms of thinking about the unthinkable. And um, we would like to hear, we'd like to have a discussion. I'm going to try and facilitate a discussion. Uh, actually, I've had quite a bit of training in doing this sort of thing. I'd like to have a facilitated discussion. If you heard something that you'd like in what we said, please let us know. Say something about it. If you didn't like something, we're happy to hear that too. We're all pretty much adults and we can handle some criticism. If you have other ideas about things that we didn't cover, uh, then we'd also like to hear that. So we'd like to hear some discussion. Yes? Ah, oh, we need a microphone. Yes. <clears throat> Well, I, uh, my name is Jane Mosselin, and I work for um, UNDP um, as a senior consultant, former staff. So I'm a disaster manager in the global community, in, um, and I would like to make some comments. Good. I um, agree entirely with you that it's time for all of us to start to think about the unthinkable. Um, I had a hard time in actually convincing my colleagues uh, most of them were afraid in the sense of, so, well, this is not a biology 101, so this is won't happen, so why think about it? So I think this is the main point that we have to break through. Um, the issue of uh, empower communities um, to actually understand their own risk and face their own risk and going away from the paternalistic kind of behavior, that the emergency services actually will go there and save their lives. I think this is a key issue. I will bring the example of the earthquake in Sumatra in 2004, <coughs> that I was deployed there when we were still collecting bodies and people were still dying. So we had an embedded disaster, as you know. But the interesting thing is when you, uh, I run a survey, because this is what I had to do, collect the stories of survival or death um, to be part of archival analysis. Um, so what happened is that who, who died first? I'm not sure if you know. The disaster managers. 
Yeah, so the trained disaster managers <coughs> of the emergency services of Indonesia were the first ones to die. Why? Because the earthquake came at magnitude of 9.0, and they were away, five kilometers away from the impact area, from the coastal area. So they were worried about their houses, which were in the coastline. So they took their cars and they came back. So in the end, we didn't have one single disaster manager to help us in, in the rest of the, uh, of the emergency procedures. So in Indonesia, learn about that mistake. <coughs> and they did have experience before with the Krakatoa explosion that generated a volcanic explosion of Krakatoa, generated a tsunami with massive amount of killings. But they did incorporate into the new script of the training of the disaster managers, the unthinkable, which was already there. Um, the other point that I would like to make, <laughs> without being too long, um, is on the issue of who survived from the population on, on Banda Aceh. Well, from the overall 250,000 death toll that we had, um, who survived it? Because I went through the camps to talk to them. The employees of the fish factories and the oil factories. Why? Because those were the two industries that had a decent disaster risk management in, in plan, taught the employees, and made the assumption of the unthinkable that a earthquake will be actually followed by a tsunami, and the second wave is the most dangerous and don't ever go to see your house. So those completely intact. Anyways, I don't want to go so long. The Haiti earthquake, the international community knew the vulnerability of Haiti. We knew about the seismic fault underneath Port of Prince. We actually asked the donors community to help us to put our emergency preparedness plans for earthquake, which will reduce the, the mortality improve a little bit the housing and etc cetera, etc cetera. well the donors didn't want to do it because of the situation the economic situation of haiti which you know very well that was very poor before yeah so it was not a a, a problem of not knowing what to do and where your hazard is located is if you don't have the money coming from the international community you cannot make miracles as you cannot do research unless some foundation, grant foundation will give you the <coughs> money. Um, my last point, severe space weather. The unthinkable. So maybe you know that one of the major risks that we're facing right now is the solar flares on the electrical grid that will be collapsing. Contingency plans are in, in plans, but I would like to put into your unthinkable list. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think Ken, Ken, let me let me just hop in for a second. I mean, there were three. There were lots of things in, in that in that series of, of questions, but I want to make sure that we we pull some pearls out of that. One is. We spend a lot of time in disaster management observing lessons, but we don't always learn them. It's really interesting that for every after action, every hot wash that I've been through, you know communication didn't work. Well, what part of newness is that? So at some point in time, one of the things that we've really got to do is find a way to transfer that knowledge where we really truly do change our approaches and change our systems so we're not constantly making the same mistakes over and over again. And we can do that both by, by making sure that, that we memorialize the lessons that we've, we've learned through the disaster, but also learning from each other. I know a lot about hurricanes. I know a lot about tornadoes. I don't know very much about blizzards. I honestly don't know very much about earthquakes. But if we're going to get this right, one of the things we have to constantly do is look for the ability to collaborate together so that we can share lessons and say, what, what of those lessons, what of Gavin's, for example, experiences? would be replicable in the areas that I'm working, and what are my experiences or your experiences that would be replicable to us? So we need an ability or a forum to be able to exchange those ideas. So we're not just constantly writing the same after action reports, observing the same failures over and over again. The second piece is, 
yes, we need to continue to look at sort of new risks because there's always going to be something out there. Tom Sizemore, who's now the Deputy Assistant for Preparedness at HHS, his first day on the job walked in and said, we're ready. There's nothing that Health and Human Services can't do for health care needs because we have 12 different annexes to our disaster plans. And the phone call rings, he thinks it's somebody congratulating, him, picks it up and says, we have a satellite falling out of orbit that may hit a major population center. What's your plan for a falling satellite? And Tom took a step back and said, I think we need a 13th annex. So there's a whole list of opportunities, again, that we need to share with each other. Solar flares are certainly one, you know, electrical impulses, certainly cyber attacks now in terms of taking down systems that, that we rely on. I think there are 83 things to worry about, the last list that I saw, which means there's probably 84, 85, and 86. And again, that's an opportunity for us to share lessons and share collaboration. Back to Haiti, there's a, there's a photo that, that, that you can see from Haiti in which you'll see the Digicel building is still standing. Why? Because Digicel, two things. We know we're on a fault, but we have the money to build something that's earthquake proof. There's always going to be a challenge in the planning within our communities in terms of being able to say, do we have enough money? Do we have enough courage? Do we have the political clout? Can we change the building codes? Can we change how, how we're going to actually take proactive steps? There's always going to be an economic equation to that. And what I would suggest is from my side, but I'm really kind of a bean counter at heart, is that one of the equations has got to be this economic value of action information, which is if I don't take those steps, what's going to happen? Because I would argue with you that the cost of the loss of any event is always far greater than what you think it's going to be. So we need an ability to be able to articulate that then to convince both the local communities and perhaps the international community that it's better to take those preventive steps. We heard from someone, I think at the introduction section, about for every dollar you spend on mitigation, you save $4 on, on response. I think there's a lot of validity in the U.S. We tend to use a slightly lower number. It doesn't matter. But I think there's a lot of validity to that, and that's part of the reason for this panel is to engage in that discussion around mitigation is not simply reducing loss when it occurs, but it's really about looking to take proactive investments today in our communities to make them more resilient. Yes, thanks, yeah, I'm Jaap Kodai from Delta from the Netherlands. I, I do not agree. I, I'm very happy that we are very overconfident, actually. We, I think man, human mankind survived two and a half million years because they are very uh, optimistic about their behavior. Otherwise, they would never have hunted big animals, for instance. They are terribly dangerous, mm -hmm. and, and they, we would have died for famine long before. So I don't agree that, and, and I don't think that we are now in a position, after all these years, that we are now immediately in a, in a threat that we should be uh, not overconfident anymore. I'm very happy with it, actually. Well, uh, you know, our, our brain is actually hardwired for confidence because you're right. That's actually, as a general rule, we're more positive. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, you ought to meet some of the people I have to work with. But, but the truth of the matter is we're hardwired to be confident and we're hardwired because that's what's driven our success. You're 100% correct. But with BP, let me just go back to BP for a second. When BP took the position, nothing bad could ever happen, and if it did, don't worry, we can fix it. I would argue that if you could roll back time, the BP would have spent that extra $500,000 on that well to be able to, to deactivate the well during an event because they were overconfident in their management against what I would say is managing a realistic situation. And so I think there are times that overconfidence can get you into trouble. I, I prefer realism to overconfidence. Yeah, I agree with your example. <laughs> uh, that's not the point. But uh, if you make from the example, you make a general statement, and I would be very careful with that. That's what I mean. I mean, I can also find examples that, well, that, uh, that prove. I would be very happy that uh, I didn't think uh, unthinkable before, before I would do something. Thank you. Uh, on the overconfidence, <coughs> sorry, on the overconfidence, um, I, I don't know if it's what you met in your presentation, but it's a major flaw. I mean, you have a number of studies in behavioral psychology that clearly shows that we are, our brain is built overconfidently. I'm not going into details, but basically, if you ask people, it's a classic test, like answer to a list of questions with a um, 80, say 80% 80 confidence. If we were well calibrated, you would have 80% uh, right. 
And it turns out it's, I mean, there are massive evidence that it's not the case at all. And what does it mean? It means when, when we think about risk, we clearly very much are over, overestimating, over, overestimating them. So uh, I think in that sense, overconfidence is a problem in human mind, but the kind of the good news is that it's kind of, uh, it's really just possible. It's not like we need a third arm or something. It's something that the brain can work out. And it's actually kind of amazing that there is no, not much program with trainings actually just to calibrate people and to learn. It's not only about learning to use quantitative techniques and so on and fancy stuff, but there are rather simple training that can help people to better behave with, uh, with numbers and probability and hence uh, improve their uh, risk management. Yes, there's actually, there's a great book out if, uh, and, and you're 100% correct, and there's a great book out Sam Savage wrote called The Flaw of Averages. And in that book, one of the things that he talks about, and there's a second book followed up, I think it's Doug Hubbard, I think, that then wrote, you know, why risk management is broken. And one of the things he does in that book is, is he lists a series of questions that you can take. And, and I did. And I took him and said, well, of course I know these answers. And the fact is I didn't know them. Um, and his suggestion is exactly yours, which is, in fact, you can fix risk management by recalibrating our ability to think more accurately and not just always trust our gut judgment, but to go back and actually think more accurately. And that's a great point, and there's some very good books out that uh, I think support that process and some good research that support I, that. I, I also want to go back to the overconfidence in that we are increasingly a technological society, and there, I hope there aren't any engineers here. Put your hands over your head because the engineers tend to believe that they can handle any problem. Okay, whether it's nuclear reactor, don't worry, it's safe. The levees, don't worry, we built them. I went talked to the Corps of Engineers, you know, we got the Mississippi River, we worked 150 years, it's fine. And the following month there was a flood. So um, I think part of the problem is that maybe engineers tend to be overconfident and they have managed largely to sell that overconfidence to us and therefore it's more precarious than making our own decision about whether or not to go out and kill the mammoth. Oh my God, we are the engineers. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I, one of the slides I didn't show was actually the scream. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to, to uh, um, ask uh, your suggestions and ideas on how to deal with different kind of risk and disaster. That is the, uh, 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 the risk of, of uh, the global food system. I think over time, I think we know it's coming because water is getting short over time, not 20, 30 years, maybe 40 years. The land, arable land, is also becoming short over time. Population, some parts of the world is still growing. I think we know that is a disaster that is coming in some time to come. But because it's so distant in a way, Mm -hmm. It's so difficult for people to visualize it, unlike the earthquakes and so forth that you hear about. It's much more difficult to, to, uh, 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 to communicate that the risk as an immediate issue, and hence more difficult to convince people to act now. And I wonder uh, uh, what suggestions you have in, uh, uh, in, um, in helping to visualize this risk, helping to make it more immediate risk for all of us, so that the, the, the actions can be taken now. What instruments do you have? How, what do you suggest the, to, to, to make that happen? Thank you. Um, my first reaction is that we're going to start seeing examples in places where we're, we're either either land or water become limited enough to create food problems, food security problems. And so we may not have them yet. I mean, we, we can blame drought, we can blame flooding and so forth. But running out of water, I think we are going to see examples of that. Running out of arable land, we're going to see examples of that. And so soon you will have the equivalent of a Fukushima or a Three Mile Island or a Chernobyl with respect to these more climatically driven 
uh, example. So I think there will be examples, unfortunately. They'll be local, they'll be relatively local, but they will then serve as a basis for pointing to things and saying to people, that's what's going to happen here if we don't do it. Yeah. I think two things. First is, you can begin to build simulations and models. I, I, one of the, I still believe that one of the, the opportunities is to create more visualization, understanding visualization around the problem so that we can see the problem evolving, not just from a print or charts, but, but actually visualize. So you can actually build some fairly powerful simulations and models to begin a discussion. I mean, I urge from the line, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so one is to really create some visualization. The second thing is to really be able to broaden the community to seek answers. You know, I think one of the things that happens is we, we tend to look for answers within a confined either economic or academic or, or political environment. But in fact, what we're beginning to find more and more, and certainly wise companies are doing this, are pushing these challenges out truly to a larger community. And so is the answer maybe a different crop that uses less water? Is the answer connecting supply chains differently? I mean, we saw that just literally this past year in Kenya when you had this sort of huge influx of, of IDPs coming across the border. You have these, these IDP camps that are set up. There's a shortage of food. But literally, you could only go a few miles down the road and see that there were actually bumper crops that were available that could have been sold if we had just accessed the local markets as opposed to some of the typical sort of global you know, NGOs for response. So I would encourage visualization, but I would also encourage then getting the community involved in looking for the solutions. And we're beginning to find, and, and forgive me because I don't remember what I was reading. Oh, I think it's the book Cohesion, but I'm not sure, but I can give you the link if it is. Um, written by the futures for, for uh, British Telecom. And who's, again, suggests whenever they have a difficult problem, if they push it out literally to the planet, the planet will come back with the answer. Um, and so getting more people involved in the answers and solutions, I think, is also an opportunity. And, and I think we'll discover that there are, there are ways of improving the system that we, we haven't really capitalized. I think the number is 60 to 80 percent of the food produced in Africa doesn't make it to market. There's a similar number for India, the amount of food that just gets, gets uh, spoiled <coughs> in one way or another. So, I mean, maybe you can increase the food supply by building better roads so that food can be brought more easily and more cheaply to market by providing inexpensive storage facilities. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways that one can tweak the system and, and, and gain more time. And, and I think these are things that may well come out of more community-based activities. People are aware of these uh, at that level. Um, I think one more. Yeah, go if on. If I can just ask, uh, I, I teach a course at Penn State on man-made natural disasters and terrorist emergencies. And the challenge that I throw out to my students is look for historical lessons, lessons learned, best practices, evidence-based decision-making. What they come back with me, me with was, that after action report was so hard to find. Where's the clearinghouse? You know, every disaster I've been involved in, we've sat down for weeks and months to develop those after action reports of where, what were the barriers, what were the roadblocks, what, what needs to be changed. But the dissemination and the distribution of those products become so challenging for us. So again, still, we don't have a United Nations organization, we don't have an international donor, we don't have a government that has taken on and said, we could provide a clearinghouse facility or support to ensure that people, but we have the technology, and we've heard a lot about this week, about different technologies and different discussion groups. What I'd be interested to hear is, that, and I see all of us sitting here as, as, as the community, you are my colleagues, I'll be meeting you in the field one day. Who in the last, who, who this year has read an after action report? What was it about? Does it count as one that I wrote? Yeah, of course it does. <laughs> yeah. um, it was about a crowdsourcing fund. So. Where did it go? Uh, a journal on information retrieval. And that journal's available where? Uh, online, for free. And do you know what, how, how many times your article's been cited or read? Um, well, it's only been out for a couple of months. Um, in the low thousands, it's been downloaded. I have no idea how many people have read it. Wouldn't it be really cool if you could map the people that have read and accessed your article, and then we could work out where the gaps are and see how we could fill those? Um, yeah, I don't want to see the gaps and who hasn't read it, but sure. Okay. But it's something to think about. And again, you know, the number of times, you know, the 
uh, a, you know, a tax in the, in, in, in the US. You know, we've talked about them for years, we've looked at them for years. I was still surprised about two months ago, I was at a meeting where we were talking about the after action review. It's a huge paper and it's available, really readily available. And the number of people in that room that hadn't looked at it, and they're the people that, are, they're, the, they're the emergency managers that are going to be the decision makers in the next disaster and trying to, and from a, from a uh, decision making, from a capacity development, that's what we're trying to, 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 uh, to strengthen. So if anyone's got any ideas, let me know because I think there, there are, the technology's there, the platforms are there, we've just got to come up with the how. What's that? Google Scholar. Google, Google Scholar. That's a really good point. I was involved in a flood incident quite recently and we had a situation where the flood had occurred and we couldn't get boats to communities. We needed to deliver insulin. We needed to deliver other medications. So we worked out that we could use jet skis. But we didn't have jet skis. We contacted Google and we said, well, you know, your network, who, who have you got? And they said, we've got this one network where we can tap into 2.4 million people in this particular area at this particular time. And I said, can you put out a call for jet skis? And they did. And suddenly we had all these people coming in and I said, get your jet ski, go down to this park, meet the person there, we need jet skis. And in a, in within half a day, suddenly a resource that the government didn't have, we had access to. Um, did I have that in place before the disaster? No. Should we have had it in place? Yes. We knew that boats were not going to access these small towns that would be cut off by any sort of flood. So again, let's start brainstorming and using the available resources that we have. Okay, I think we are out of time. I just had one, one thing to, to, to leave you with. <coughs> but we, we really need to be thinking about things in a new way. Otherwise, we'll just simply get what we've gotten before. <laughs>